Throughout the history of <clears throat> mankind, some of the greatest rivalries have been between siblings, between family members, between brothers. Uh, kingdoms have risen and fallen uh, behind interfamilial squabbles. Interfamilial squabbles. And it's odd. Um, in secular history, but also in biblical history, in biblical history. Think of the, the rivalries, if you would. Um, in the Tanakh, in the Torah, um, you have Cain and Hevel. One brother was jealous. He wouldn't do the right thing, even though he knew to do the right thing. And he rose up and he killed his brother with a rock. Today, some brothers, right down the street here in East Oakland from where I live, every day they kill their brothers with a rock by selling it to them. Rivalries that didn't get quite as bloody necessarily was uh, the rivalry between the Tomim, the twins, um, Esav and Yaakov, Esav and Yaakov, even though um, Esav determined in his heart that he wanted to kill Yaakov and he fled. It could have turned into that. Or the Tomim, the twins, Zerach and Peretz. Zerach and Peretz, who were tussling around in the womb of their mother till one thrust his hand out, the one called Peretz, thrust his arm out, and the shifcha, or the midwife, tied a tulat sheni, a crimson thread around the hand to show that he was the firstborn. Um, that young man, Faritz, breached and made a way for himself. That's a little hint, a little clue to one of the future videos coming here really soon. But I want to talk to you today um, about family about interfamilial squabbles. And there's none more intriguing, none more epic than what happened in the family of Yosef. Yosef, um, in this week's, or the week that just passed, in the parasha, Vayigash. Vayigash. So with that, Shalom, Shalom, Shalom. U v'ruchim habayim la'arutz ha'katan sheli achim ve'achayot. Mishpacha haikara sheli. Today, Hayom, I want to talk to you about that aspect. Um, the parasha, known as Vayigash, which means, and he drew near, and he drew near. The he in this context would be Yehuda. And this parasha is found um, in chapter 44 of Bereshit, chapter 44 of Bereshit, Starting at verse 18 is where the encounter starts. Um, one of the biggest and most intriguing things about the whole storyline of the Torah and the Tanakh is that it lays out the righteous line, the righteous line, the line um, of the people who said, yes and amen, I will walk with Hashem. Um, and throughout this timeline, different messianic archetypes are highlighted. For example, we know that Adam, of course, was a messianic archetype, even though he failed. Okay, uh, Adam Hakadmon, the first uh, Adam fail, failed. Uh, but then Shet, his son Shet, the righteous line, Seth, Shet, he came along, he walked the walk. We had people, people like Hanoch. Hanoch walked with Elohim, and he was no more because Elohim took him. Noach, Noach ish tamim bedorotav. Noach was a blameless man among his generation. Uh, Abraham himself was a messianic archetype in that he was the answer to the wickedness that Nimrod brought, brought into the world. Um, Avraham was the answer to Nimrod, and of course, uh, Itzhak, Itzhak was 
and not recognized uh, properly as such, he was one of the greatest examples of the Mashiach in that he was the promised seed from the standpoint of if there's no Yitzchak, everything gets cut off. Um, he was also an awesome messianic archetype um, because of the single fact or the simple fact that he was a chip off of the old block when it came to faith. How do I know this? Well, Yitzchak was not a little bitty boy as our biblical cartoons and books want to portray. Uh, when he was taken up to Moria by his father, uh, Avraham. And when Avraham was told, give me your son, your only son, Yitzchak was late 20s, maybe early 30. He could have handled his father. He could have stopped him. So Yitzchak had to be willing to allow himself to lay on that altar and be bound, okay, and to be brought to the, well, brought to the brink of being sacrificed, but functionally he was sacrificed. Functionally, he was sacrificed. Um, because, and also the, the writer of the book of Hebrews also agrees with this, that Abraham, he did so in his heart. Functionally, he did sacrifice him. Uh, so there have been lots of messianic archetypes, but none more stunning than a Yosef. So in the parasha Vayigash, Vayigash, we find that we have the ultimate archetype of Mashiach in Yosef, but for a moment somebody steps in front of him, steps in front of him and blocks him out completely. The great messianic archetype of Yosef is in the shadow of someone briefly for a moment. And I want to suggest to you that it's possible that that one person that stepped in front of him for that moment and shined a little bit brighter may have altered the plans of the Most High, or he may have earned something that he may not have had before. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I want to go here um, immediately to the text. But I want to start at chapter 45. Chapter 45, verse 1, kind of to set the table, to set the table. I like to take things to the high point, to the peak uh, to the apex, right? And then build from there, go backwards, and then come back to that point later. So in chapter 45, verse 1, it reads as follows. And you know, I have to be honest with you. Um, I have never been able to read this account without breaking into tears, literally. But don't worry. I read it a lot this week, and got all of, you know, the, the fountains flowing and whatever. I don't think there's anything left. So I'm not going to come apart on you. You don't want to see my cry face. I've been told my cry face is pretty scary. Uh, so here's how it goes. V'lo yachol Yosef lehit apek lechol anitzavim alav va yikra hotsiu kol ish me'alai. ולא עמד איש איתו בהתוודה יוסף אל אחיו. Verse 2, וייתן את קולו בבכי וישמעו מצרים וישמע בית פרעה. Verse 3, ויאמר יוסף אל אחיו, אני יוסף, אני יוסף, העוד אבי חי. So it says that, Chapter 45, verse 1, and Yosef was no longer able, Lehit Apek, to restrain himself or to hold himself back anymore. And he cried out, Hutsiu. He tells everyone, Get out, get out from before me. And there was no one standing in front of him except for his brothers when Yosef, Lehit Vada, made himself known to his brothers. And he said the words, Ani Yosef, I am Yosef. Haod Avichai, is my father yet living? You know, I think one of the biggest impediments to becoming more biblically literate, believe it or not, is one of my old pet peeves from the old church life. Read through the Bible in one year. It feels good to say in a calendar year, okay, in 356 or 365 days, 
I was able to read through the entire Bible, but you ran through it, you raced through it. If you didn't gain anything uh, that you can use to implement into your life to bring about change, to allow the word, because the word will do that in and of itself. You don't have to just focus on the commands of the word. But if you read with understanding, if you read with um, a humble spirit and, and a desire to learn and to understand, he will lead and guide you into truth and your life will change from that standpoint spiritually. But then also there are things hands-on that we can do that are in the commands that are in the word of the Most High. So the reason why I want to talk about this parsha, everybody talks about this parsha, you cannot let the year go by without talking about this, in this parasha or this portion of the Torah uh, because it's huge, it's huge. And there's always a different aspect or a different angle. Like a fine jewel, like a fine jewel, you can have a common truth. But then because of the cuts and the facets, the more you turn that jewel, you'll see something a little bit more dazzling. You'll see something that you missed from before. you see how flawless it is. So each and every one of us, regardless of who you are, you don't need to have a huge platform on anybody's social media. You don't need a wooden pulpit uh, to stand behind or some type of stage or whatever. All of us are flames of fire and are ministers. Um, and in some cases, we need a nudge or we need a push from those around us that love us and that care about us or those wiser, older, seasoned graybeards, right, that can see it in you and cultivate it, right? And and show you how to seek the Most High in order to bring it out. We all have something to contribute. No big eyes and no little U's. I talk about this particular parasha with passion because it's often read through quickly, brushed aside. And even in the Torah, the greater Torah-keeping world where people discuss it, they typically ask the same old questions over and over again. I like to approach things from a different angle. I like to turn it inside out, hold it up to the light, separate it into pieces, see if I can move the pieces around. What else is there in the text, in the text that is calling out to the reader? It's up to you and I to find it. It's up to you and I to find it and allow the spirit of the Most High to lead us and to seek that guidance. But there is the, the Pishat, there is the Pshat or an Aramaic Pshita, there is the bare naked or the plain uh, reading and meaning of the text. And then there's the Sud, there's the Sud, there's the foundational or the secret part, the part that's concealed, that's in the text. We have to look and we have to ask the right questions and the text will answer you. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. So that was the apex, chapter 45, verse 1. That was the apex. That's when Yosef could no longer contain himself, and he revealed who he was to his brothers. But what I want to talk about first is, what was the mindset of Yosef? All the time during his initial part of his captivity, from being in the house of uh, Potiphar, uh, from being thrown into jail, what was his thought process toward his family? Did he care if any of them were alive at all? Apparently he did. Um, but his care and his concern, the greater part of his love seemed to be more for his father and for Vinyamin, especially. We're going to talk about why? There are always some tumultuous circumstances when you have a mixed family, okay? And if <laughs> ever there was a mixed family, uh, this is definitely one. That's the word, as a matter of fact. Uh, let's see here. The word that I want to talk to you about. Oh, yeah. Uh, for your enjoyment, uh, people have often commented and said, hey, you wear some interesting shirts you know, uh, different things and whatnot. My shirt here says, yep, Guns and Moses. Guns and Moses, you know, like the, welcome to the jungle, you know, crazy folks. Guns and Moses. Guns and Moses, but it has Torah scroll up top. Um, 
I don't, you can see the little um, uh, menorah here. I don't subscribe to anybody's armies really per se, uh, but uh, this was a great gift, a wonderful gift. Shout out to uh, my good friend, Ms. Jeanette Hardy uh, for hooking me up with this shirt. I really, really like my Guns and Moses shirt. Uh, <laughs> they're sold in Israel. Uh, primarily uh, at these little gag shops. And they're, I think they're really cool. So I want to talk, uh, again, as a part about talking about family, I want to uh, put up for you here uh, the Hebrew word for family. The Hebrew word for family. And, of course, we hear it a lot. We use it. I hear people within in our community. Mishpacha. Mishpacha. Mishpacha is the Hebrew word for family. Now, of course, you know in the past I've talked to you about the fact that every Hebrew word has at least more than 90% of the time a three-letter root word or shorish. Shorish. Shorish is the Hebrew word that means root. Excuse me. In its plural form, shorishim. Shorish. Shorishim. Roots. 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 And in this case, Mishpacha, Mishpacha, the root word here that I want to basically focus on is found right here in the middle, right here in the middle. It is Shafach, Shafach, Shafach. Uh, the Shin, Fe, and the Chet, Shafach. And it comes from the word, uh, means more or less, uh, carries a connotation to join, to embroider, or to join by embroider, embroidering or intertwining oneself with others. It's also related to the word shafach, which ends with a chaf, which means to pour out, lishpoch, to pour out. So to intertwine oneself with others, to enjoin, but also to pour out oneself for the ones to whom they've enjoined to. Uh, for example, um, we have the word shifcha. Shifcha, and it's right there as a matter of fact. You don't have to do much but take away the mem, okay? And the shifcha is the handmaiden. Now, every now and then Google, not Google, but uh, people ask me about Strong's. Strong's does pretty good sometimes. But Strong's has a tendency to just put too much on certain words. And in this case, shifcha, they will translate it, I think, as slave. And it's not that. Shifcha is a handmaiden. Like, for example, bilha and zilpa. Bilha and zilpa. Between these two women, they produced 10 of the young men who eventually became the progenitors of 10 of the tribes of Israel. The other two sons were the sons of Rachel. That was Yosef and Binyamin. So a shifcha is a maidservant, but also in most cases became a member of the family and became intertwined within that family. Why? Because they bore children and in a lot of cases became the husband, uh, sorry, the wife also of the one whom they were serving. And Bilha and Zilpah is a great example of this. Through them came ten of the 12 members, or 10 of the 12, uh, 10 of Jacob's 12 sons, shifcha, shifcha, intertwine, and then pour oneself out. And if you gave somebody 10 kids, I think you poured yourself out. Uh, yeah, for the lack of a better phrase, and to keep it respectful. Okay, so shifcha. So mishpacha, mishpacha is a group of people who are intertwined, who pour themselves out one for another. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of the members of the family in Hebrew because I don't want this to be awfully long. It's probably going to have a little length, but I think it's worth it if you can hang with me uh, on this topic. Uh, so we start, if you look at the Hebrew individually, the members of the family, you can often find aspects of their role contained within... Contained within, left that on, uh, contained within their name, like for example, Av or Father, Av, spelled with an Aleph and a Vet, Av, 
Av is very authoritative, very authoritarian. Av is father. Av is father. Okay. Uh, we've talked in the past about Abba and Ima. Abba is an Aramaic word. Abba, spelt with an Aleph, Bet Aleph, or Aleph, Bet Aleph. Abba is very soft. It's very endearing. It's like daddy or papa, okay? Very endearing. This is why Yeshua said, or uh, not Yeshua, but uh, was it? I don't know. I'm terrible. Uh, we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We cry, Daddy. He's our papa, okay? Um Av, a first one. Okay, so Aleph means first one, strong one. The ox's head, first one, strong one. That is a tent or a house. A tent or a house. So he's the first one and strong one of the house. Ab or Av has the preeminence. He is the provider. Uh, he is the protector. Um, he's all of those things, the guardian, all of these things. He has preeminence. This is Ab. First one, strong one of the house. Okay, stay with me. Please. Then we have the mother. The mother who is called in Hebrew M. 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 If you're used to Ima, again, it's the same thing. Ima is Aramaic. Ima is like mommy, okay? Spelled with an Aleph. Mem Aleph. So, M, or mother, Aleph is, again, the ox is hit. First one, strong one. The Mem is quite... You can't plumb it. It's too deep. Something that I'll just touch on a little bit, but I'll leave it alone and run away. And I promise to come back and cover a little bit of it in uh, in a future video. But the mem represents water. Maim. Maim. Water. Mem uh, has been... Uh, mem also stands for, or it represents, uh, in a lot of circles of thoughts, Mashiach, the one who would bring water. Remember, this guy stood on the stairs of the temple and he said, Ho, whoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, he was mirroring or echoing Isaiah chapter 55. There is a Mishnaic saying that says, Ein maim ela ha Torah. There is no water except for the Torah. The word of the Most High has always been paralleled with water. Paralleled with water. For example, remember when the exiles, uh, the Judean exiles returned uh, from captivity. It was Ezra, Ezra the scribe, who took uh, the Torah of Moses and he read it before the people at the water gate. At the water gate. Again, these things are not happenstance. These things are not accidental. This is by design. Also, this is the final form of Mem. Okay, the final form of Mem. And in the scribal writings or in the style of the letters, they are. it is literally two Dalits Two of the letter Dalits, one turned on to the other, and they represent, of course, you know, the letter Dalit is a door, is a door. So the, the closed mem represents the womb, the womb of a woman. Now, why? Why? Well, the Hebrew word for womb is rechem, rechem. The Hebrew word for a womb is rechem, and it ends. It ends with a closed mem. It ends with a closed mem, rechem, rechem. What is it that we know about the womb of a woman? Well, this is where life is produced. Okay, we come into this world oblivious, right? Oblivious, and we're completely encapsulated in a sack of water, breathing this water, if you would, and we're inside of the rechem. But what happens if you change the cantillation of this word? What if you change the cantillation of this word from a rechem to rachem? 
from Rechem to Rachem. Remember a man crying out, Yeshua, Yeshua, Ben David, Rachem Alai, Rachem Alai, Yeshua, Yeshua, son of David, have mercy on me. Rachem means mercy or compassion, mercy or compassion. So the womb, in that very sense, is a place of mercy and of compassion, which is why people feel so strongly as they do about aborting or taking life. Okay, that's not my endorsement for whatever view or whatever. I'm making a statement here. All right? Don't want to trigger anybody. I also have to show you the open mem. The open mem, okay, as it appears when it's at the beginning of a word or anywhere else in the word except for at the end. An open mem represents an open womb where life has come forward, where life has come forward. And of course, you know, during birth, when the womb opens, water flows. Again, there are reasons for these things. So the mother, in a nutshell, is the first one, strong one, and she is the one that brings life. She is the one that is merci merciful. She is compassionate, but she is the single unique creature that can produce life within her. Okay, you've heard it said that uh, mommy is the name for God on the lips of a small child. Okay, uh, they bring about life. They bring about life. Okay, uh, the word also filters from that mom, from that mother in a godly household. It filters from that mom to to her children because it came from her husband. So she brings life. She also brings the word with her as well. And then finally, brother. One last member here of the family. Ach, 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 brother, ach. And that brother, the ox's head, first one, strong one, and the chet is a letter that represents a fence or a barricade. A fence or a barricade. So downstream of the father, it is the brother that is the protector of the house, the one that will raise a standard or a barrier, okay, against those who would do harm, against an intruder, against someone who pushes back against his dad's will, the will of the house, right? Um, in the unfortunate demise of the father, in the ancient households, it was that brother, primarily uh, the oldest brother, that would make sure that a potential husband for his sisters would, would be vetted and vetted properly. Are you good enough for my sister? Do I have to put these these hands on you? Uh, you know, um, and he set those things up and make sure that the sisters were taken care of and that the house and that the mom was taken care of as well. This was dominant throughout the ancient culture. So the brother is the first one, strong one, the barricade. He is the second line of defense behind the father, and he becomes the primary line of defense in the unfortunate demise of, um, of the father. So here, let's race to the text here, and we're going to cover this. I'm going to ask a few questions, and I'm going to pose, pose a hypothesis, and then I'm gone. Okay, so the stage has already been set. We know that at the beginning of chapter 45, Yosef raises up his voice and he cries out. And it says the whole house of Egypt heard him and the whole house of Pharaoh heard him when he cried out, Hotziu, go out from me, all of you. And it says no one stood before him when he, lehit vadah, when he made himself known to his brothers, and he says, Ani Yosef, Haod Avichai, is my father yet living. We get to the opening of the parasha at chapter 44, verse 18, called Vayigash, and he drew near. And this is where Yehuda, Yehuda steps forward in a way that he never had before. We can say, well, where were you 
when you allowed them to throw this boy into the hole? Why didn't you step up then? You know, everybody always talks about Judah. Judah goes first. Judah, Judah, Judah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ra, ra, ra. Tribe of Judah. But why did he have that reputation? After all, Judah was also known for some other things that weren't quite so wholesome. Like, for example, there is a Mishnaic saying that says that while after um, Yaakov passed away, it says that while um, while Israel mourned Jacob, Judah was busy bringing the Messiah into the world, which means he was out there putting that work in, right? Anybody he liked with a high-pitched voice and long hair, Judah was was on the job, you know. Uh, yeah, he was busy. Uh, so he's known for things other than the, the, the crystal, crystal shiny image that we have in our selective reading. But where was he when the boy really needed him? In the end, it didn't matter because he shined when it needed to be. But here he is in chapter 44, verse 18. He's approaching Yosef because now we find that Yosef wants to know a couple of important things. Is my father still alive? And before that, he wanted to know if his little brother was still alive. And this is why I said we would come back to that and why that's important. Um, I'm going to show you why that was important. In verse number 29 of uh, chapter 43, verse 29 of chapter 43, Yosef demanded, if you don't bring the little brother down here so I can see him, I want to put my eye on him. If you don't bring him here, don't even come back anymore. Verse 29. He lifted up his eyes and he saw Vinyamin, the son of his mother. Not just his little brother, but the son of his mother. Remember, Yaakov loved Rachel, period. And that's who he initially worked for until he got tricked. And he ended up having to take uh, Leah initially. He had to work another seven years you know, in order to have the woman that he truly loved. But he had two sons from the woman who he truly loved. That was Yosef and Vinyamin. So it did matter within this intermixed family. It did matter that Vinyamin was the son of his own mother, Rachel. So he sees his brother, and then Yosef says this, is this the little brother that you told me about? And they said, yeah, it's him. So Yosef set up a feast. They all sat down and ate, paraphrasing here to move quickly. And in verse 34, when they set places, or rather verse 33, it was considered an um, abomination to eat with Hebrews. Egyptians couldn't eat with Hebrews. So any idea that the notion that you can't sit down and share a meal with someone that's not a member of your ethnic group, it goes well before uh, oral Torah and what's called, uh, in the New Testament, it's called Mesoret uh, Hazkenim, Mesoret Hazkenim, the transmissions of the elders or the tra traditions of the bearded ones. Uh, this outdates them by a trillion years. It's not even close. Okay, so that's not exclusive to uh, to Judean custom, all right? It goes all the way back to Egypt. And we know this because we see that in verse 33. So he set them up from the oldest to the youngest, which should have got their attention. He knew who was the oldest all the way to the youngest. But anyway, they set the places to eat uh, in verse 32. They set a place for Joseph alone, right? Separating royalty from the common people. Okay, Velahem Levadam, and for the other brother, for the brothers, uh, for the Hebrew brothers, they set them a place to eat alone. Okay, Ulemitzrim Haochimito Levadam, and for the Egyptians who were going to eat in the same room with them, they set a place for them alone. Why? Kilo Yuchlun Hamitzrim Lechol Et Haivrim. It was forbidden for the Egyptians to eat bread with the Hebrews. Why? He toavahu lemitzrim, because it was an abomination to them. 
But the point of the whole matter of me bringing this part up is that when he sat down with them, he gave Vinyamin five times the portion of food that he gave the rest of these guys, right? Because when he sees his brother, he was moved in verse 30. He, when, he, when he sees Benjamin, his emotions almost grab a hold of him and he needed to go and cry. You know, ever been pent up and you needed to just like, you know, the peanuts, Charlie Brown, ah, you know, just get it out. And you need somewhere to go and get that out. So he had to go into the other room, cry, maybe scream into a pillow, wash his face, redo the makeup, put the crown back on and come back outside. Yes. You know, I'm sorry I was indisposed. So he had to go and fix himself up and he had to come back out. But now, think about this. If Yosef has been thinking along the lines of those dirty dogs, if they did what they did to me, I know they hated my brother Vinyamin because we come, we are the two sons of the woman that our father really loved. But his hope can start to build now because he forced their hand and made them bring Vinyamin down and he sees that his brother is alive and he's well. What's another angle of this? Another angle of this is that Yosef had to roll the die to think about the prospect of if my father is truly alive, I can check one box off when I find out that my, my little brother is still alive. But if my father is truly alive, because I don't know, I don't trust him, if he is truly still alive, I have to roll the die and make them bring my brother, knowing that the possibility of taking that the last one from him, from the woman who he truly loved, might kill the old man. Might kill the old man, but he had to roll that die. And they brought the brother down. So that gives uh, Yosef a little hope is starting to build now. So my little brother's alive. I can check that box off. Is it possible that my father is still alive? Is it possible that my father um, is still alive? He even asks the question a couple of times about your father, about your father. Is your father still living? In verse 27 of chapter 43, it says, This is when they came back for the second trip to get more food. Okay? He asked about their wellness, about their completeness, about their shalom. Okay? And they said, we're well. And then they also said, Hashalom avichem hazaken asher amartem odenu chai. He says, and he also asked about the shalom of your father, the old man, avichem hazaken, who you say is still alive. And they say, your servant, our father, he has shalom. So he's inquiring. So now, now this sets the stage for the opening, okay, uh, because now he has to push the envelope to find out if his father is of a truth alive. He has to push the envelope just a little bit further, and he has his, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, his divination cup, his golden cup. He has it placed in the mouth of the sack of Vinyamin, and he sends them on away. Then he has his guys go and catch up with him and say, hey, we need to check your items. And of course, they bring them all back. And it's come to find out that something has been stolen. And Yehuda is playing, uh, what do we call it in Hebrew? Orechidin. He's the lawyer now. And he's saying, hey, no one would do such a thing. Uh, Khalilu, Khalila to us. It's, you know, forbidden. May it never be that we would do such an act and steal something. And Yosef said, okay, whoever sack or whoever is found to have my divination cup will stay and be my servant forever. Basically, that's a death sentence. That's not, you'll stay and be my servant and be my cup bearer, or you'll sweep the floors in my palace. No, that's a death sentence. And of course, you know the story as it turns out. When they open up the bag, of course, in the mouth of Vinyamin's bag is the cup. And here's where Yehuda, okay, steps briefly in front of Yosef to outshine him as an archetype of Mashiach. 
But before I can go further with that, I have to, let's lay out, let's lay out all of the reasons that Yosef is a great archetype for the Mashiach before we talk about what Yehuda does uh, did. So Yosef was despised of his own people and rejected by his own people. Okay, he was clothed for a period of time in a coat, kutonet uh, psalim, a, a, a coat, a multicolored coat. He was given a little glory, and it made him be despised. So he was thrown into a bor, into a hole, into a pit, into the belly of the earth, and he was abandoned. He was pulled up and out of that hole eventually, yes, but then he was given away to the nations, given away to the nations and basically left for dead. He became salvation to the nations, to the ones whom he was given away to, okay, who he was given away to. And by extension, he became salvation to his own, even though they did not know him. Even though they stood right in front of him, smelled his breath, and looked him in the face, they did not recognize him. As it says uh, in the Torah, it says, Vayakiru Yosef et benav vehem lo yakiruhu. Yosef recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And after all, what was Yosef doing on his way to go and see his brothers? He was only doing his father's will. His father told him to go and check on your brothers. Remember the parable of Yeshua when he talks about the vineyard? They send servants. They kill the servants or do whatever. And then he says, he sends a son. Surely if I send my son, da-da-da-da-da, and they kill the son. So now all of those great things, right? All of those great things that Yosef did, or exemplified or emulated that showed or exuded that had messianic qualities? How is it that Yehuda could step in front of him and block him out for a moment and potentially lock something in? I want to talk about that. Well, I'm going to show you how. Chapter 44, verse 18. Vayi gash elav Yehuda. And Judah stepped in front of uh, Judah, Judah approached him and he said, Be Adoni, the Berna Abdecha, the Varbe Ozne Adoni, the Avichar Arpecha, be Abdecha, Ki Kamocha, Kefaro. Please, my Lord, with me, let me whisper something into the ears of my Lord. I am your servant, and please do not let your anger flare against me, because you, Kamocha, Kefaro, you are like unto Pharaoh, Yehuda basically goes through everything that happens. He happened. He did an instant replay from the first time they made their visit, and he said, "My Lord asked us this, and we said, blah 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 blah. And this happened, and we said, blah blah blah." He went through all of that. Now keep this in mind. This is the first time that Yehuda steps up. And all of his other brothers just fade into the background. They become shapeless, colorless lumps. They fade into the background with the Egyptian guards and whoever else was in the room. And Yehuda becomes the voice of the voice. He speaks for his family as a whole and authoritatively. And he lays it down to this Mishneh Lefaro to this second person, to Pharaoh, because keep in mind, remember, Pharaoh said, I am only more powerful than you when I sit on my throne. So he's in standing in front of all of this power, okay? And he makes the case, and he turns the tide. Okay, and um, I'm going to take it home down to where we hit the nitty and the gritty. In... Verse 31, he's talking about what would happen if I go back to my father. And again, Yosef's not even sure if he's alive. He talks about what will happen if he goes back to his father without the boy, 
without, and we'll talk about that too, without Vinyamin, what would happen? Verse 30, 31. en hanar vemet. And when he sees that I've returned without the lad, he will die. Vehoridu avdecha et seva avdecha inenu beyagon sheula. And your servant, our father, will go down with his gray hair to Sheol in anguish, in anguish and in grief. Verse 32, he says, Ki arev et lemor im lo avinu alecha, he says basically that the old man and the boy are intertwined. They are intertwined. And he said he made basically a promise, a guarantee that he would bring the boy back. If he doesn't, he will have committed a great sin against his father all of his days. He says another thing that's really important here. That's a couple of verses up, and you'll find it in verse 30. He says, Ve'ata, and now, Kevoi el avdecha avi, when we go back to your servant, our father, Ve'ana'ar enen uitanu, and the boy is not with us, or the lad is not with us, Ve'nafsho kishura benafsho, Ve'nafsho kishura benafsho, the soul of the lad is tied up, kishura, with the soul of the old man. And finally, this is where he breaks Yosef. This is where he breaks Yosef. He says, Ve'ata, in verse 33, Ve'ata yeshevna avdecha. And now let your servant, me, remain here. Tachat na'ar evet le'adoni. In the place of the boy, a slave to my Lord, and the boy will go back up, or will go back to Canaan with his brothers. And finally, verse 34, How can I go back up to my father and the boy is not with me? What had to have happened within Yosef had to be explosive. It had to be explosive because here he is with all of these feelings about his brothers, you know, the ones that did him so bad, that did him so bad, but he was able to check off a couple of boxes. He doesn't know if his brother, the two people that he really loves, that he really cares about, he doesn't know if they're still alive. But he's able to check out off a box when he demands that they bring the boy back. And they bring the boy down and he sees that his brother's still alive. Check that box off. Now he really knows. He's desperate to know if his father's still alive. So he pushes the envelope, pushes the envelope. And Yehuda steps up and becomes the voice of his family. But the biggest messianic picture that's shown here is that in verse 33, he says, let me stay in the place of the boy. He basically offered his life, Yehuda did. Yehuda did in verse number 33, Let me stay in the place of the boy, a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go up with his brothers. Yehuda was willing to give his life to not be responsible for an event that would kill the old man. So if the old man was in fact not alive, why would Yehuda even care about Vinyamin? There had to be someone back in Knaan who was worth sacrificing his life for. And that's when it hit Yosef. And he realized. And then the next chapter starts with the Yosef lo yachol hit apek mitzavim alav, and he could not 
will restrain himself. And he screams out and cries out, and the house of Pharaoh hears it. Uh, all of Egypt hears it, and Pharaoh's house even hears it. And he says, Ani Yosef Ha'od Avichai, he asks a question. He says, I am Yosef. Is my father truly alive? And again, look, I mean, I, I have to make this point. It's important. My Bible has no English in it. It has no English in it. But I want you to understand why I'm saying it. It's not a brag. It's not a horn tooting moment. But if anything, it's self-deprecating. What I'm saying to you and to all of the members of my community is that if a country boy from Palestine, Texas can do this, anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. I'm the least of these. And we make these claims and we, 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 we grab a hold of a culture um, and an identity that of a truth is ours and that belongs to us. We love the name and we love grabbing uh, uh, the title and claiming it, but we don't want the things, by and large, that come along with it. How in the world, why would we want to be like members of the Nation of Islam who claim Muslim this, Muslim this, Muhammad this, Muhammad that, but they don't know, they can't read a lick of the Quran. You ask them what a hadith is. They don't know what that is. You ask them, ever heard of uh, Sahih Bukhari? And they're like, oh yeah, I bought some last week at $5 a pound. They know nothing about these things. They, they rely on these English translations of the Quran and a lot of this whatever. Let's not be that. Let's learn to read the language of our ancestors, the language of the book, let's learn to read it. Let's be proficient so when we go on to other people's platforms and we need to defend our faith, that we're not doing like some of these people on these platforms that I've seen on Berean's channel who offer uh, up uh, to speak for our entire community, people like Wiggins, whoever he is, I don't know him, but you don't get to speak for me and for an entire community while claiming to be a member of the House of Israel and a member of the treasured people, okay, the priest and kings and priests of the earth, and you're telling people how it's okay to order the pork chop platter. It's contradictory. You cannot take the truth of Hebrew scripture and mix it in with piss poor translation and Western Greek philosophy that has... Uh, it is the source of Christian doctrine today. Doctrine, that's a very slippery word. Doctrine, beware of doctrine, okay? So yeah, it's a passion of mine that we learn the language of the book. I was talking with a, a good friend of mine uh, the other day, in person, met her for the first time. Shanshan916, a shout out to Shanshan916. And we had that conversation about how we have People who have these huge platforms, da, da 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 doing a lot of great, good things for the community. Learn to read biblical Hebrew. You do need it. You've been told for forever that it doesn't matter, that you don't need it anymore. Now you've eyes wide open, flown into uh, the knowledge of an identity, and you still don't want it. Stop listening to those people, okay? Again, if I can do it, anyone can do it. I'm the least of these. But what that leaves us with is this, you guys. I'm sorry about that tangent. What that leads us to is the fact that when he makes the big reveal, the text goes on to say that they can't even approach him because they're stuck on stupid. All right? So in verse 4, Yosef says, Gishunai lai, and so he says, come here near to me. And they drew near. And he says, I'm Yosef, your brother, who you sold to Egypt, but don't trip on that. It was the Most High that sent me here ahead of you to sustain you, to uh, sustain you and to, to keep you alive during this time because we're only two years deep into a five-year famine. They fell on each other's neck cried and kissed each other. 
and there was reconciliation, there was understanding. But here are the questions that are outside of the box that we need to ask, including the one question that I want to leave with you to mull, to chew on, right? At what point did Yosef come to peace with not taking revenge on his brothers? After all, if I at least have Benjamin, and I know that Benjamin is alive, I can have these other 10 taken care of right here, and at least I have my little brother back. Is it possible that that was in his heart? Yes, the text doesn't say it, but it is possible. It's not impossible. Only when Yehuda stood up and offered himself as a sacrifice for the sake of his brother in order to save his father pain was when he knew that his father was alive. But I believe that it's possible that full-blown forgiveness came at that moment. Everything came in a flood. But how about this even more is a question I want to pose to you. We know that in the next parasha, Vayechi, that Yaakov gives the blessings to all of the sons. And the famous pas uh, uh, passage that Yehuda is a, is a lion's whelp and that the scepter will not pass from between the stock of Yehuda, Ad Sheyavo Shiloh, until Shiloh comes. My thought has been this, and my question to you is this. Is it possible that it had not yet been set in stone whose line Mashiach would come from? Is it possible that at that moment, with that show of great virtue and selflessness by offering himself as a sacrifice, is it then that Yehuda possibly earned the honor that Shiloh, that Mashiach, would come from his stock? Is it possible? I think it is. Just me personally. You don't have to take it. This is just my thought, that he sealed the deal right there, that Mashiach would come from his loins. And why not? And why not? The true showing of virtue, the true showing of godliness. No greater love has any man than to give his life for a friend, and how much more for a brother? How much more for a brother? Um, Yosef shared a lot of parallels with Mashiach in that he was moved by compassion, you know, for his brother, and even for all of his brothers, it said he wanted to weep on a couple of occasions because he had them all together in front of him. And then even later when you read the parasha, you see that Yosef tells them, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's talking about Goshen, of course, but I'm going to prepare a place for you, your children, your children's children, your sheep, your cattle, X, Y, and Z, so that where I am, you may be near. Sounds familiar? There's a lot to think about. And then also the final funny uh, little piece to this is how it's very clear whether it was to save their lives or whether it's just the way that they saw him, that the brothers projected to Yosef the way that their father saw Vinyamin. It's calling him Hayelit, the boy, or Hana'ar, the lad. And he was nothing of the, of the sort. Because if you think of the number of people that came into Mitzrayim with, Yose uh, with Yaakov, and you count the numbers and you do the math, some of those kids were Benjamin's kids, were Benjamin's kids. So he was definitely a father and quite possibly a grandfather. Probably in his mid-40s, late 30s, mid-40s, when he came in, and they're calling him the boy. They were projecting to Joseph the way their father saw him. Because after all, he was the last remaining son of the woman that he truly loved. And they said that the boy, the soul of the boy and the soul of the man are intertwined. And he was not a boy, he was a grown man. Yeah, so there are a lot of thoughts um, um, about these type of things. So with that, I hope I've given you something to chew on, something to mull, something to consider. Um, yeah, that's my hope. That's my hope. And that you look at your word uh, in a little bit di different in a deeper way. Until the next time, May the Most High watch over you and keep you. May He lift His face upon you and show you mercy. May he cause his face to shine on you and give you his shalom and his wholeness. 
Allah tilsi you soon. Shalom.